Um, and again, welcome to At the Heart of the Matter. We're so thrilled to have uh, so many folks with us. I was trying to take a peek and see we've got about 174 uh, folks on with us. Um, my name is Taryn Ford. I'm the Senior Director of Communications here at the Colorado Health Foundation. And I have a few uh, opening remarks and some housekeeping items to share with us before we actually get started with the formal program. So um, as Alejandro just mentioned, um, you do need to choose your preferred language for today's event from the interpretation menu. You should see a small globe on the bottom of your, uh, of your Zoom screen. And we're offering uh, both English and, and Spanish today. Um, for today's event, we're gonna be using the chat function for all communications. So if you have a comment, if you have a question, uh, if you have a resource to share, we'll also be sharing resources with all of you. Or even if you're having a tech issue, the best way for um, you to communicate with us on that front is through the chat. There's a little bit of a trick to the chat as well. It's a little different than most of the regular Zoom environments that we're used to. Um, you do need to select everyone in the chat box when you're communicating to make sure that we can see what you've got to say. And everyone's doing a great job of that. We see lots of names and locations showing up in in the chat, and if you just joined us, please make sure that you um, also share share some of that information with us. Um, so I wanted to talk just a little bit about the Colorado Health Foundation and what informs and drives the work that we engage in. Um, the Colorado Health Foundation, otherwise known as CHF, um, we are a statewide uh, philanthropic organization, and our belief is that health and well-being can be in reach for everyone. Um, we are headquartered here in Denver, but we work all over the state. Um, and we collaborate with organizations, many, many of whom have joined us today. So thank you again for being with us, as well as communities across the state to break down the many systemic inequities that stand in the way of health and well-being. Um, our work takes a lot of different shapes. So of course, we're a grant maker. We engage heavily in policy advocacy. We also um, offer different types of capacity building. And we do lots of different types of convening, which of course we're all engaged in right at this very moment. Uh, we also have three cornerstones that drive how we work. So first, uh, with the ultimate goal of improving the health of Coloradans, which is our mission, we do everything with the intent of creating health equity. Second, we focus on those across the state who have less power, privilege, and income, and as a result, are less likely to be healthy. We prioritize people and communities of color, because they're more significantly impacted by systemic and historic barriers that stand in the way of health and well being. And third, in partnership with the communities that we serve, we support and fund community informed solutions that drive health equity and racial justice. So let's get on with our show. I'm excited to introduce this first 2024 virtual event in our At the Heart of the Matter series. Um, today's event is called Change Narratives, Change Minds. And um, this virtual event series, we actually started during the pandemic and it has endured. Um, this uh, series features our president and CEO, Karen McNeil Miller, in conversation with leaders and different types of experts to discuss the impacts of systemic racism on our health and opportunities in life. And Karen is joined today by Jose Antonio Vargas, who has some absolutely incredible insights and stories to share with us. We're so thrilled to have him with us today. So again, a uh, couple last final reminders here. Um, while using the chat for all your questions and comments, um, make sure that you're selecting that drop-down option labeled everyone. And again, we're not gonna have a live Q&A today. So if you have um, things that you wanna get in front of, of Karen or Jose, um, make sure that you put those in the chat. We do a good job of keeping our, on, our eye on things and, and Karen does as well. And then lastly, if you haven't done it already, um, please make sure to choose your preferred language from the interpretation menu. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Alejandro Jimenez. Um, Alejandro is a nationally and internationally recognized poet and writer. Uh, he resides currently in New Mexico. He hails from Mexico and his work centers on the intersection of cultural identity, race and ethnicity, immigrant narratives, masculinity and memory. His work and his personal story have been the subject of a short documentary for the PBS series, American Masters, which highlights emerging cultural icons. And Alejandro has also been featured in Time Magazine as one of 80 Mexican artists shaping contemporary Mexican culture. So I wanna give it up to Alejandro. I'm gonna pass the mic on to you. Thanks again for being with us. 
Hello, thank you so much, Taryn, and, and thank you everybody for being here, and thank you for the Colorado Health Foundation for inviting me. Um, I'm going to put um, uh, my contact information or my website if folks want to get in contact with me afterwards and that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, Dominic, I see some folks uh, as, as people were, you know, kind of, um, you know, introducing themselves. But yeah, my name is Alejandro, uh, and uh, I'm currently live in Ocapogue or Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, in Tibol land. Right. I'm a counselor. I'm a writer. I'm an educator. I've been a, a counselor for the last 15 years of my life at the middle school, high school levels. Um, and actually, um, I want to say this before I forget. Alejandro Arrieta used to be one of my former students when I I, I lived in Denver for 10 years uh, and and worked over in a, in South Federal. Um, so Alejandro Arrieta, who's interpreting for us today, used to be one of my students. So it's like, so it's like really cool seeing what you're doing, Alejandro. Um, so thank you so much for interpreting now the poem that I'm going to read to you all. Um, so, um, it's titled, um, it's titled back then. Um, and given that, you know, um, yeah, I, I wrote this poem, uh, I think a few months ago, just thinking about my experiences with interpreting for my mother when we go to, uh, uh, you know, doctor's appointments and that kind of stuff or used to go, you know, it's titled back then. Today. I'm with my mother on her second of two doctor's appointments this week. The one yesterday was her bi-monthly infusion treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. We sit for an hour while the clear liquid in the IV trickles into her veins like winter into spring. She nervously laughs and says, it looks like water. She closes her eyes and tilts her head, her head towards the ceiling. I imagine she's thinking about swimming in the river in her hometown before coming here, before the desert, before leaving me behind, before sending for me, before my grandfather was murdered and she could not attend his burial. Expensive water, I say. She smiles and shows her teeth and starts updating me in Spanish about our family in Mexico. We laugh and giggle while the nurse side eyes us with nervousness. No, I want to say, we are not talking about you. But I don't say anything. They will not understand our slang terms and how everything we are talking about has years of backstory that we've come to laugh and giggle about, despite how much of it is rooted in generational trauma. Despite how much of it feels like the longest and coldest of nights, we laugh. We giggle. Today, uh, today we are at her mammogram appointment. She has been experiencing pain in her right breast. She wants to make sure that it is not something to worry about. I interpret from my mother while my back is turned towards her and her exposed chest. The nurse gently, gently places her breast on a small platinum platform of the fancy machine while a small pearly white square lightly lands on the top of it. This process and machine will let us know if my mother has cancer or not. She shivers. I interpret. Breathe. Respire. Holding it in. No suelte la, la respiración. Let it out. Yeah. At each instruction by the nurse, I pop some sort of joke in Spanish to ease my mother's nerves. Hopefully this machine doesn't flatten your boob into a tortilla. Of course. Of course, the nurse, seems, the nurse seems to fear our laughter. Homegirl, my mother may or may not have cancer. Calm down. Like many of us, I, became an, I have become the interpreter for my mother since I said my very first full sentence in English. See, for me, for me, that was back in middle school, back when sitting in the back of the bus seemed like the only throne worth fighting over. Back when square pizza for lunch was everything that I lived for. Back when the fear of quicksand ruled my life. And Pokemon cards were the only currency that I knew. See, back when my parents were a dartboard, where I threw darts in form of questions like, you've been here so long, why don't you know English? If you work so much and so hard, why do we still live in this cockroach infested cabin? Why did you bring me here to live like this? See, back, back when embracing my tongue was more burden than gift, 
So Alejandro became Alex. Jimenez became Jim. And as became Alex, Jim became Jimmy, became a conscious act to whiten myself up. Became a race to bury my culture deeper than the Spanish buried the pyramids in Mexico City. See, back when immigration officers and immigration doctors would ask 12-year-old me, do you have lice? Do you have HIV? Do you have AIDS? Are you a prostitute? Are you a drunk? Are you a communist? Have you ever advocated for the violent overthrow of the United States of America? I wanted to ask. So there are these white kids that always get the back seats on the bus. If my friends and I beat them up, would I be sent back to Mexico? Would I be denied a green card? Also, I like blue. Can I get a blue card instead? I shook my head while looking at the ground, answering no to their question. I bit my tongue hoping I wouldn't lose the taste of home. I felt embarrassed. I didn't have more language to speak about dignity. See, back then I felt embarrassed that the nurses and doctors had to listen to my mother go on and on in Spanish about whatever she was talking about. I felt scared that they might call immigration on us for doing what our peoples have always done. Tell stories. See, back then, my mouth felt both a bullet and salve, not knowing whether my words would transform my mother's face into a field of flowers or a desolate town, not knowing the splitting of my tongue could bring my mother to tears. Ma, the doctor is suggesting surgery. Again, Miko. again. As if my mother hadn't already been sliced open every single one of those times she walked across the desert, not knowing if the sun or the vultures would eat her or if she would ever get to hug me again, what a butterfly knows about sprouting wings where there was once nothing my mother can sing songs about. So today, as a 30-something-year-old son, interpreting and morphing for the millionth time, I sit next to my mother on her exposed breast as she is rambling on and on, rolling her R's extra long, which makes me believe her tongue might turn into a river. I, I think to myself, if our trauma is tied to a collective and if it is passed down from generation to generation, then our power must be as well. So as my mother stands, unashamed, and carrying all the light in her mouth, I join her, because now I know our dignity is worth all the languages in this world. I join her, because now I know that this laughter, this giggling, this telling of stories is proof of our ancestors living through us. I join her, because she is the best storyteller that I know, and I want to feel that powerful too. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful, wonderful event. Alejandro. That was that was so power that was so powerful. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much. Um just, it was so much not the not the translating but there's so much I could re relate to with the vulnerability of your mother and the bus and everything so please tell us how your mother is what happened mm -hmm. tell us the end of the story she's doing great she doesn't have cancer oh <laughs> that's what, that's what uh, yeah she's, she's doing great she lives in Oregon my yeah with her with her um, my, with my brother and her grandkids so she, she's doing that's good wonderful. you know she, so I hope you're seeing, or we'll go back and look at all the love mm -hmm. uh, and the positive comments you're getting in the chat. And I sure echo is. each and every one of those. And I'm going to have to dab my eyes again uh, and try not to smear my makeup. <laughs> but <laughs> but no, thank you so, so much for joining us and for and for sharing that that piece of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah, like I said, hope, hope, hope. Well, thank you for the work that you all do and, 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 and 
you know, the foundation and everybody else, you know, that that's here in, in your in your particular organization. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Take care. So hello, everyone. Um, we had a powerful opening. I see you all commenting and welcome all of you here. I just see lots of friends from across Colorado. And I think I even saw someone that's joining us from New Jersey. So welcome um, across the country to this at the heart of the matter. I'm so excited for this conversation. And so I'm gonna ask uh, Jose to go ahead and come on screen and let me um, just do a brief introduction to say that I'm, I'm just so excited to be joined today by Jose Antonio, Antonio Vargas, who is a leading and active voice for the human rights of immigrants, particularly those undocumented immigrants. He's um, Written, written one book and about to finish the other. The first book's called Dear America, Notes of an Undocumented Citizen, which I love that, Undocumented Citizen. And the, the book that's about to come out is called uh, White is Not a Country. He started an organization for immigrant rights called Define American, and he'll tell us more about that. And then somewhere in his spare time, he finds the time to be a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and Emmy nominated um, uh, TV uh, filmmaker and a Tony nominated theatrical producer. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna welcome Antonio, uh, uh, Jose, thank you for joining us in this conversation. And I'm just gonna give you the floor for uh, a little bit to tell, talk about your powerful story, your work, and this whole notion of narrative change particularly in your work as it relates to undocumented immigrants. So go right ahead. Thank you, Karen. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Is it okay? Great. And if you can see right behind me, you probably can see James Baldwin. And then right behind him is Harvey Milk, a bunch of books, right? Scattered all over over there. Um, thank you for having me. I am coming from you from Berkeley, California. And as Karen said, I'm just going to talk for a few minutes and then um, really have a conversation around narrative change and what that means. Um, when this work, this phase of my work really began um, almost, wait a second, yeah, 13 years ago next month um, is when I... I did what I, a lot of lawyers told me not to do <laughs> against the advice of 33 immigration lawyers. I told my story. I outed myself um, as an undocumented immigrant in the New York Times Magazine in an essay in the New York Times Magazine in which I admitted to every single fraudulent thing I had to do just so I could stay in this country. Um some little background. I was born in the Philippines. Uh, if you see someone who looks Asian and has a Latino name, it means they're Filipino. <laughs> Some of you may have known that by now. Uh, we were colonized by Spain for 300 years. So I was born in the Philippines, and then I was sent here to America in the Bay Area by my mother to live with her grandparents, um, to, to, to live with my grandparents, her parents, uh, when I was 12. This was in 1993. And then when I tried to apply for a driver's permit, like any 16-year-old is supposed to, you know, that's kind of the rite of passage. That's when I found out when I went to the DMV to get a driver's permit that my green card and the passport that my grandfather had given me were fake. Um, and that was um, in many ways kind of the beginning of my, <laughs> I was forced into adulthood kind of early because of that. Uh, I was confused, like a lot of people are when it comes to immigration, because my grandparents were both naturalized U.S. citizens. So why did they have to bring me here illegally? Um, why couldn't my grandparents petition me? Why isn't my mother here? Basically, the complexity of the system that is just as complex, if not even more so than the tax code in this country. Um, and my salvation really came in three different forms. Um, one is... I was just really lucky. I had a I had a teacher, Mrs. Doerr, in 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 high school, who said that I asked too many annoying questions in class, and I should do this thing called journalism. I I didn't know what that was. You know, my 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 grandmother was a food server. My grandfather was a security guard. In the Philippines, people were farmers. Um, you know, a right nobody wrote for a living, but 
I um I I find out that when you write an article, a news article, you get this thing called a byline, right? So by Jose Antonio Vargas. Um, and so I thought if I can't be here because my papers are not real, at least my name could be in the newspaper. I thought that was my way of saying that I'm here, that I existed. Um, the second form of salvation was my high school principal and my high school superintendent. Um, I grew up in Mountain View, which is kind of at the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, and they were the ones when I was in high school, you know, I was a freshman when I found out I was here illegal. I kind of gave up. I didn't take the SATs. I wasn't thinking of college. You know, my grandfather's plan was to have me work under the table jobs until I found somebody to marry who was a U.S. citizen. And that that's how I could adjust my status. But at, during that time, I basically came out as gay. <laughs> Um, and coming out as gay was my my way of saying, wait a second, we've lied enough. <laughs> There's enough lies in this, and I don't want to lie to anybody else about who I am. And so I'm not going to marry a woman to get papers. Um, as you can imagine, that caused some tension with the family. Um, but my high school principal and my high school superintendent um, made sure that I went to college. So they found um, benefit. They found somebody who started the scholarship fund. In 2000, I graduated high school in 2000, um, who didn't care about someone's immigration status. Back then, you know, there was no language around dreamers, DACA. There was no vocabulary around that, right? And the third salvation was Toni Morrison. <laughs> I was really lucky in eighth grade, um, you know, three, just two years after I arrived in this country, I was in eighth grade and my English teacher assigned the bluest eye for the book club, the after school book club to read. And if you have not read The Bluest Eye, I strongly, I strongly recommend it. Unfortunately, that that classic book is actually being banned in many parts of the country. Um, and that book landed like a bomb in my head. Um, and the biggest part of it, conceptually for me, as again, as somebody who's neither black nor white, um, and as somebody who tried to understand what is this place that I just immigrated to? Like, how do I fit in this country? Um, the whole concept of the book, Toni Morrison wrote the book, she said, because she wanted to know what happens when someone surrenders to the master narrative, when someone becomes the perfect victim, that this young Black girl wanted to have blue eyes because she thought that her Black eyes were not enough. Well, Morrison was asking, who told her that it wasn't enough? And why did she believe them? What was the narrative back then that still continues in many ways till now about the inferiority of having black eyes and why were the blue eyes desirable? So those were the questions that somehow this undocumented gay Filipino, <laughs> you, you gotta love America in that way. I don't know if Toni Morrison thought that her work uh, would free uh, an undocumented gay Filipino, but that's exactly what it did. Um, and from an early age, it made me really question, well, who gets to be legal? Who made these laws? Right? What is the master narrative? And how do I not surrender to it? So coming out as undocumented was my way of not surrendering to the master narrative, to not be this illegal alien in people's minds. And also to make sure that when people think of immigration and undocumented people, we don't racialize it to, to such a point that we only think it's about the U.S.-Mexico border and that it's only about Mexicans. I actually think this country, you know, owes the Mexican people an apology for having racialized this, this issue as much as we have, especially considering that a big part of the country used to be owned by Mexico, right? Um, so that's the work. And to be honest, when I started this 13 years ago, I started using the term our goal was to change the narrative on immigration. And I would say narrative change. And organizations and funders and foundations had no idea. They were like, what are you talking about? And you're probably wondering why haven't they deported me? I have no idea. Um, but after I came out as undocumented, I asked the same question. Why hasn't the Obama administration contacted me? Um, I was a political reporter for the Washington Post, so I actually have interviewed Obama myself. And I'm surprised that no one no one contacted me. So I actually called the editor of Time Magazine and I said, hey, I, I want to write a follow-up story as to why I have not gotten contacted. Um, so I did. I In the story, I actually called ICE myself 
I was living in New York at the time. So I had to call the New York office of ICE and said, hey, you know, I'm here. Why haven't I heard from you? <laughs> I remember the woman in the line was like, what are you doing? I was like, well, what are y'all doing? <laughs> you know, like, we're here. We've been here. We pay taxes. We contribute to this society. You know, we're here. You know, undocumented people in many ways are visibly invisible, right? And then when that story came out, I'm really proud of this. So this was the first time that undocumented people were on the cover of a major magazine, right? And this cover actually shows the diversity of the undocumented population, undocumented Black immigrants, undocumented Asian immigrants, undocumented white immigrants. There's an undocumented guy uh, who was born in Germany and moved to Ohio when he was 10, but nobody thinks he's undocumented. An undocumented Nigerian woman, you know, one out of 10 people in this, one out of 10 Black people in America is an immigrant, right? And there are about estimates vary between 500,000 to 800,000 undocumented Black immigrants in the country. And yet they're not a part of the narrative of immigration or undocumented immigration. Now, there used to be a time in this country when you wrote an essay for the New York Times Sunday Magazine, you got on the cover of Time Magazine, you make a documentary for CNN, which is what I did 10 years ago. You do all those things, you've checked all those boxes, and you've you've infiltrated the mainstream media. And you have effectively changed a narrative. We don't live in that kind of time. We do not live in that kind of time where CNN, you know, CNN is lucky every night if 80,000 people watches their program. 80,000, right? In reality now, we live in a much more fragmented time media-wise and our strategy at Define American, which is this organization, please check it out, defineamerican.com, is how do we actually look at narrative change in a much broader and also in a much more specific way? So that's what I wanna talk to you really about. You know, at Define American, you know, we believe that politics are a downstream from culture. You know, um, we actually, and and at a touch to the to the theme of this gathering, we have a long um, a longitudinal study called "Change the Narrative, Change the World" about immigrant representation in television. So, narratives for us are like an invisible hand, you know, that guides perceived reality. What you watch, what you read, really shapes your attitudes and your minds over time, and that creates that creates the the real, kind of the oxygen for policy change. Most people in the 70, 70, about 70% of Americans live in homogeneous, homogeneous neighborhoods, meaning their interaction with people of color and with immigrants in Colorado, where one out of 10, one out of 10 people in Colorado is an immigrant. In Colorado, one out of 10 US born American citizen as an immigrant parent. So much of what shapes Colorado, you know, people in Colorado's perception of immigrants is the media they consume locally and nationally, right? So I'm actually sharing right now. So this is this is that report that I just that I just talked about. Um, and in that report, we we basically studied, you know, how are immigrants portrayed in not only, by the way, broadcast TV, but streaming shows like Netflix, right? Um, at DA, at the Brand American, we believe that narratives are comprised of stories that are activated by conversations. And we define conversations um, as an exchange of ideas and information through various mediums, right? It's the TikTok video that just got texted to you. It's the YouTube video that somebody at work probably sent you. It's the headline that you saw on CNN that makes it way into the Denver Post, right? It's all of these things. For us, stories are experiences that are shared to foster connections. The goal is to connect. And storytelling is the most powerful and impactful form of communication, right? Um, and by the way, I'm going to put this in the chat because I actually think defining our terms when it comes to narrative and storytelling is really important. And I hope that you can use these definitions to like inform the work that you do as well, right? So at Divine American, we've moved through many approaches, right? We've tried because we've been around for 13 years. We have moved through so many different approaches to changing narratives. And we're using everything we've learned from research, right? From work with the field, with storytellers themselves, may they be TV writers, film directors, Broadway playwrights, right? Um, to build the hub 
we're actually calling it a story lab to provide resources just from all fields. Our goal and our mission is to be, if you want to tell an immigrant story, may you be a journalist or you're creating an ad, right? You go to us, right? You can go to us and we can help you do that, right? Um, we can share with you copies of our research and tools we've come really what I'm compiling for the past few years now. We'll share this after after this presentation. We'll do it over email and Karen and her team can share it with all of you. Um, what I'm about to share right now on the chat, this is our media reference guide, actually. This is kind of an immigration 101. Everything you ever want to know about immigrants in this country is in that guide. And that's the kind of guide that we share with newsrooms, with local newsrooms, with nonprofit organizations, with anybody really who wants to tell an immigrant story, right? It includes best practices, detailed descriptions. What's a refugee? What's an asylee? What's a DACA recipient? What's a dreamer, right? All of those terms that, to be honest, the general audience don't really understand, right? A major focus, I have to talk, I have to really share this, a major focus of our work recently has been developing evidence-based tools for shifting the immigration narrative in digital spaces. Um, I don't know if you all know this, but YouTube is actually the most powerful technology in the world. YouTube. You can, you can binge watch an anti-immigrant ideology on YouTube overnight, right? And us in the immigrant rights space are have not been equipped to go up against the decades long anti-immigrant machine that is not just Fox News, it's PragerU, it's Breitbart, it's literally all of these platforms, right? That are impacting how people think of immigrants, right? That's shaping the perspective. You might've heard of a phrase called the great replacement theory, right? Okay. The great replacement theory. Um, it's, it's, it's been a narrative that has been espoused by anti-immigrant folks from the Trump White House, actually, when Trump was elected, that all these immigrants are are represent are gonna are gonna replace white people in this country. So just some numbers. There are 45 million immigrants in America today. 45 million immigrants, 11 million of whom are undocumented. Those 45 million immigrants are Latino, Asian, and Black. For the in the next 50 years, according to the Pew Research Center, 88% of the population growth of this country. You can see this in Denver. You can see this in Colorado. That that growth comes from immigrants, that 88% growth. Now, the anti-immigrant side calls it the great replacement. In this book that I'm finishing now, I'm actually calling it the great replenishment. In the same way that Italians, Germans, Irish, Swedish, all of those immigrants from Europe, before they got to be white, they replenished this country. And in that very same way, Mexicans, Filipinos, Indians, Chinese, Nigerians, Jamaicans, all of us, right, are we are replenishing this country. And what makes us different from all of those European people is it because they get to be this one thing called white? Well, what what is even that? And just so you know, the title of this book actually came from an exchange I had with a student. Um, I've been traveling. All of our strategies, by the way, is because of a lot of what I've been experiencing personally. And then I go back to our director of research and I say, hey, how do we know this? I was um, doing an event at the University of Georgia. And some, early on when I started doing events, I would get protested um, by, unfortunately, college Republicans on campus. So I was getting protested at this event. And, you know, as a person of color, I always get asked where I'm from. So now I've gotten in the habit of asking white people where they're from. So I was asking the student, hey, where are you from? And he said, you know, I'm American. I know that. Where are you from? And then he says, well, you know, I'm white. Well, but white is not a country, right? Where are you from? How is it that I have to know that I'm Filipino, second generation, right? Fifth generation, Mexican-Americans, fourth generation. And why is it that you don't have to get to know that about yourself? So that that's actually the 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 inspiration for for the book, but in this d work that we're doing on on YouTube, um, our original research that we did actually tracked this great replacement and the network that it's created, right? And it's a powerful and well resourced network, strategically pushing this theory that people of color are replacing white people. 
And this has been this has been really cemented, not only for the Fox News Breitbart crowd, it's really gotten cemented with young college students, right? Where PragerU has become their number one source for information, right? And when we've done this work, and you know, this is a really, really um, I'm putting this on the chat right now. This is um this is something that you would want to study because it's 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 pretty thorough. It really explains what this great replacement theory is and how um how ubiquitous it's been. Because what, what happens now is it's on PragerU, it's on Breitbart, it's on YouTube, but when you read the New York Times, when you read the USA Today, it's infiltrated that, right? Um, and what we've done is we've started working with social media influencers to create videos that combat this anti-immigrant media, right? Working with influencers. So it's not just going on CNN, MSNBC. I used to go on Fox News a lot. It's not being fought on cable news. It's being fought with social media influencers on Instagram and TikTok, right? How do we work with them to make sure that they're not misspreading information and disinformation and that they treat and talk about immigrants, if they're immig also if they're immigrants themselves, as people, right? As human beings. Actually, in a few weeks, we're about to release the most extensive research on what we call the movable middle. Unfortunately, on this issue on immigration, extremes, it is treated very in such extremes way. And even within the people who support immigrant rights among progressives, immigration does not, um, that does not excite them in such a way that other issues do. For example, many polls have shown that within progressives, legalizing marijuana is always ahead of legalizing people, right? Immigration doesn't crack the top four or five concerns for progressives. On the other side, when you read the news coverage, this is very consistent. Immigration is almost their number one issue, right? So all of this misinformation actually elected a president and may re-elect Trump to a second term, right? Immigration being that animated issue. So if you look at all of our research, if all it does is it actually gives you tools. So when you sit with your own relatives and your own friends, you can actually inform them, right? So we're about to release this research on movable middle. And what, what we are finding out is where do people spend their time watching content? What immigrant, anti-immigrant narratives they actually encounter and wear? And where are there meaningful opportunities where we can actually play the offense? So uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, of, a, of a sneak preview. We found out that children's programming, children's TV is a big place where we can insert pro-immigrant narratives. Because television shows for children, as you know, is not only the kids watching that, it's the parents watching that, right? And right now, there is not a single television show aimed at children that talks about immigrants or have any immigrant characters, not much. So that's the kind of research then we go to producers and networks like Nickelodeon, like the Disney Channel, and say, a lot of your audience are immigrants. And if you want to see them as people, not as a political pawns, let us help you do that, right? So that's how specific we, we, we get into this work. And then the last thing I want to talk about and then do this, you know, have this conversation with Karen is when you see an immigrant character on television, maybe Grace Anatomy or Superstore on NBC, that has been a big bulk of our work. So for the past five, we've consulted on um, over 100 television, television shows and films featuring immigrant characters of various races and ethnicities, right? So if they want to have a storyline about someone who's getting arrested while they're an intern at a doctor's at a hospital, like in Grey's Anatomy, we consulted on a on a on an episode of Grey's Anatomy where ICE actually came to their emergency room because one of the doctors, one of the students, the medical um, 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 trying to get her internship is documented, has DACA, right, and it's about to expire. Uh, we we consulted on a show called Superstore where there was an undocumented Filipino character. And he was actually his name is Mateo. Um, he was arrested at this at work, and then all of his colleagues were like, "Wait, like, what are they doing a raid? And what do we do now?" So, for many people who have tuned out the news, television is so powerful, right? Because it's the only way that they get to meet these characters as 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 as, as people, right? And the last thing I'm going to put in the chat here: 
this is what we launched actually last year in LA, in Hollywood, is we launched our immigrant representation scale. So if you're writing an immigrant character, please go through the scale and ask yourself all of these questions. Are you, are, how do you not do a good immigrant narrative? How do you make sure, you know, that undocument that when you present someone who's undocumented, they're not a criminal, right? Because whenever you see an immigrant character on TV, they, they're often thought of with a storyline of being criminals. When in reality, immigrants, particularly undocumented immigrants, commit less crime than native-born U.S. citizens. So for us at Define American, our job has been, how do we help storytellers, right? not do any more harm when it comes to misrepresenting immigrants? And how do we help storytellers have facts and context and stories that actually humanize the immigrant experience? And when Karen and I were preparing for this conversation, I think it's really important to know that all of us are media consumers, which means that all of us are responsible for educating each other. Like, I hope that when you deal with someone at work or at home or in your neighborhood, who's spewing something that's incorrect or inhumane or inaccurate, that it is actually your job to correct them. That's your job. And that you, um, in whatever way you can, show up in that way. Well, okay, Jose, you just gave us so much there. I wrote down all kinds of questions for us to, for us to unpack. And, and so first of all, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for the work you've done. Uh, in, this is completely off topic, but since you mentioned the, the name Mateo, I just read um, just this week, they you know they, they report the top five boys and girls names of the last, oh. last year. <laughs> and for the first time, a Latin name made the top list of boys. But the, Mateo is in the top oh. five names of boys now from in, in, in the U.S. for 2023. That's amazing. I did not know that. <laughs> great. Yeah, that's great. So I have so many questions, but I'm going to start with one that's not about immigration, but I want to ask you, which was harder, coming out as gay or coming out as undocumented? Oh. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, I, what's harder? Uh, you know, I, I'm going to bring in Toni Morrison's master narrative. Okay. Is because for me, I don't think of myself as coming out. I think of it as like, how do I let people in? Right. Because I've always been gay to me, <laughs> you know, being undocumented is something I've been dealing with since I was, you know, 12 years old. So I feel as if whenever I say coming out, I feel as if I'm surrendering to people's idea of what I'm supposed to be rather than I'm so fortunate that, you know, even though I'm physically, I have physical limitations, right? As an undocumented person, I haven't been able to leave this country physically since I was 12. I feel as if, I, I am like intellectually borderless. I have been very, I've tried to really educate myself to know that being undocumented and being gay um, does not make me intellectually a minority. Do you know what I mean? Like sometimes when we, when we sometimes my danger, and I struggle with this, Karen, because in, in the state of California where I live, 60% of California is Asian and Latino. 45% Latino, 15% Asian. And yet so much of the language, minority, 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 wait a second, 60% of, and if you include the black population, 67% of California is people of color. The fifth largest economy in the world, California, 67% are people of color. And yet where's the power, <laughs> right? And so I think the language around that, I have to say to be, to more directly answer your question, um, I think I'm still trying to understand what it means to be an undocumented gay person and how to make sure that the societal limitations, that I don't internalize the limitations that society has put upon 
undocumented and queer people. And then since Harvey Milk is right behind me um, in Baldwin, all the, the debt, the enormous debt that I owe to all of the gay, lesbian, bisexual, queer, trans people, um, you know, it, it's kind of amazing, Karen, to think clearly we still have a long ways to go. But when my 22-year-old nephew, who's, you know, cis male, um, two weeks ago at a brunch starts, you know, pulls me aside and says, uncle, um, I think you just misgendered my friend. And I was like, oh, did I? Yeah. And, you know, you should apologize. I'm like, you know, like, that's amazing. Like that we live in the kind of world where my nephew can do that. Right. And, 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 and and that and that the language around you know sexuality that we are more accepting yeah. clearly again there's still more work but we are more accepting you um with james baldwin behind you and um you were so kind to send, send us one of the chapters in your new book oh yeah it, um james baldwin rocked my world in college and it was the exact quote that you have in your chapter which is you have to decide who you are and force the world to deal with you, not its idea of you. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember when I read that, I professed to myself then and there that in my, when I started my professional career, I would comport myself into whatever way professionalism was defined and that I would elevate it by being black mm. and that I would never not be black in in a work environment. I just, when you, when I read that in your chapter, I was like, that just took me back because that, <laughs> that quote charted my career. Yeah. Oh, isn't that amazing though, how language can do that? And, you know, and, 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 and Morrison actually has this other line about it, which has been so useful for me is when she says, you don't live there. You don't live in people's minds. You, you get your job done and then you go home. So I am not this, and for me, I took that as, I'm not this illegal alien in people's minds. I'm not that person, right? I'm gonna go do my work, <laughs> right? I'm gonna write, I'm gonna produce, I'm gonna direct, I'm gonna lead the front, that's what I do, right? And my worry, Karen, is, how do we make sure, you know, our director, by the way, the woman who leads all of our research, all of our original research, um, uh, her name is Sarah Lowe, and actually uh, she's earning her PhD in public health, right? Um, because we, she believes on, uh, and, and uh, her work is in the social um, determinants of health, right? And really what social inequities, like what do all the undocumented people in Colorado Right, like how how is the severance between the government? Right, thankfully in Colorado, people can get driver's licenses if you're undocumented. By the way, kudos to Colorado. Colorado is only one of the 17, 17 states. You you are one of the few states um, that allow undocumented immigrants to drive. Right, Texas does not. Texas has one point eight million undocumented people, and they do not allow. I don't know how people get around in Texas. Clearly, undocumented people are driving around because half of their industry, construction industry, is undocumented labor. The farmers are undocumented. How how do they get to Walmart? How do they go to church? How do they get to work? Right. And making sure that we see immigrants, particularly undocumented immigrants, if they're good enough to be our labor, to provide us labor, how do we think up as deserving of healthcare, right? To take care of their physical being and their mental being. Um, I think that's so important and it goes beyond Republican Democrat, right? Mm -hmm. It's about the fabric of our society, right? And I, I think of the word community right now as a, sacred, as a sacred word in the same way I think of citizenship as a sacred word. Mm -hmm. And it's not just citizenship about the papers that I don't have. It's citizenship about how do I show up in my community, right? 
Um, and to me, those are the core questions. You know, um, we focus a lot at the Colorado Health Foundation also on power and communities utilizing the power they have. And one of the things you talked about, I don't remember if it was in your first book or the chapter you sent us, was uh, that um, legality has always been a construct mm. for power. Yeah. So talk about that narrative of um, legality and power for just a minute. Then I want to talk about media. Yeah, well, and... And again, I, I was just really, I was just really fortunate that I grew up in a community where there were that there were James Baldwin and Toni Morrison books at the library, right? Where my white teacher assigned Toni Morrison books to read. Um, by the way, this next book that I'm finishing now, I just, I just decided it's going to be dedicated to her, to Toni Morrison. Um, and I have this great privilege that the person editing the book. Errol McDonald actually used to edit Toni Morrison. So it's kind of an interesting life cycle in that way. Um, because her books, Beloved, Sula, Song of Solomon, Tar, her, her books in many ways were historical novels. They really capture the Black experience in such a way that non-Black people can look at it and go, wait a second, what was the legal structure of the country when that was happening? Right. What what was happening? And and for me, if you look at immigration law in this country, right, um, and how people of color, the Chinese Exclusion Act and what that did, right? Barring Chinese people from coming. The fact that the Philippines, I remember I was doing an event in North Carolina, um, Wilmington, North Carolina, and I said, um, there are almost two million Filipinos in the United States. I mean, in I'm sorry, two million Filipinos in California. There's 5 million Filipinos across the country. There's 2 million in California, almost 2 million. And I'm not sure, by the way, if undocumented Filipinos are counted in that 2 million. And then this elderly man at the end got up and said, why are there so many of you here? And I said, well, you know, sir, we are here because you were there. We are here because you were there. Remember when you took the Philippines? and claimed it as property, that was legal. That was around the same time you took Puerto Rico, right? We were your property for 50 years. You owned us. Why are, why are there so many Filipino nurses? There's so many Filipino nurses because, the, because America literally trained Filipinos to be nurses to take care of them when America owned the Philippines, right? So in many ways, the way we framed the country is around who has the legal power to determine who are subservient to the powerful. And now I think our lack of understanding of that own history, like most Americans have no idea what the US-Mexico war was and what it did. Most Americans still don't really understand what Jim Crow did and how Jim Crow still lives with us today. Like most Americans have no idea that Asian Americans in this country are the fastest growing racial and immigrant group in America. 70% of all Asian adults in America are immigrants, 70%. Asian immigrants are more immigrants than people in the Latinx community are immigrants, right? So to me, all of this information and data that I'm giving, they're not really forefront in the consciousness. And because of that, the way we think of the constructs of legality has been very limited. You know, and, and when people ask me, I remember when I when I, I first started doing this work, people say to me, why are you flaunting your illegality? Which I thought was an interesting question. And I said, you know, sir, that all I'm doing is showing you your laws. These are your laws, right? Now, I'm going to give you your problem back. It's right here. Why did you have to create illegal illegal as a concept for people? Why do you need it? And by the way, if you don't need it, then why does so much of your labor depend upon it? Yeah, that's because so many, so many of the laws were about power. You can't. Yes. I think it was the you know uh, the indigenous population weren't allowed to be 
it was illegal for them to be citizens of the mm -hmm. United States until, I don't know, what, the early 1900s. Yes, yes. That was about power. But they, it was framed in legality and laws. And we can go back and back and back and back and back and frame yep. that. But the narrative of someone, someone in the chat's talking about, we were taught whitewash history in public school. But mm -hmm. the narrative is very different. The narrative we all grew up with, the narrative we all probably internalize and have to sh and have to unlearn and shed ourselves of has been honed and crafted over time. And I and I would say, Karen, part of the struggle is, you know, again, so there are 45 million immigrants who moved to this country because of the Immigration Nationality Act of 1965, which would not have passed if the Civil Rights Act did not, you know, was was not being what was not being fought about in 1964, right? So Asians in particular benefited from the Immigration Nationality Act, right? That's where they're the fastest growing. But I bet you right now, if we were to go to most communities, regardless of political affiliation, immigrants to this country who just arrived 50, 40, 30 years ago have no idea how this country got to be what it is, right? Like when we talk about meritocracy, when we talk about the American dream, when we talk about all these coded words. I remember when I was, you know, when I was growing up, when I got here, one of my uh, one of my grandpa one of my grandfather's sisters, Flory. So she's the one who first got here. Then she petitioned everybody else to come. Um, the anti-immigrant people call that chain migration. <laughs> I just call that that's how the immigration policy is. You know, people petition everybody. I'll never forget when 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 I was growing up here in the Bay. Lola Lola means um, grandmother in Tagalog. She, Lola Flory said, Oi, Ton, my nickname, Ton, don't go to Oakland. Just make sure you don't go to Oakland. I'm like, Lola, why not? The black people are there, right? And they're dangerous. You don't want to be around black people. And you know, I was 13, 14. I didn't know what that was and what she meant by that. And now that, you know, as I've got, I've gotten older and, you know, in college, I actually ended up majoring in political science and African American studies. Because I had an internship in Philadelphia for a summer, and that really opened my eyes about black or white, right? Because it was my first experience being in a city where black and white people were the majority, right? And so I was like looking going like, wait, what's going on? And now I can tell my grandmother, that same grandmother, you know, who said that racist statement, I could say to her, Lola, like, who told you that? Why did you believe it? And that's wrong, <laughs> right? Like, who, who's the educating the time-worn divide and conquer narrative strategy? Yes, <laughs> divide and conquer. And but, but but Karen, I really worry that we, the people, the people of color, but specifically non-black people of color, don't talk about that enough. That we just want to like we we want to like rush to the kumbaya. <laughs> Let's be together. Let's acknowledge our solidarity, intersectionality without really understanding and digging a little deeper on how as colonized people, we look at racism in a very colorist, very imperialistic way. Right. And so now that the rest of the world isn't the rest of the world that's been colonized by white people, right, by America, by Europe are now in America. And together, we're actually constructing something new. Right, And as we do that, what is our responsibility to understand the formation of the country, right? Why is it that when you look at like income, if you look at so many different rates of economic, in, in, you know, uh, in, inequities and health inequities, why is it that black people are where they're at and Asian people and Latinos are where they're at? How do we actually do that together? To me, by the way, that's the... I know for me with this next book that's going to come out, that's going to be a big part of my work is I feel like really digging a little deeper into um, acknowledging the differences so then we can work towards similarities right. and commonalities. I just returned from Ghana and they are being very successful in changing the narrative and that they don't use the word colonize anymore. They say we mm. were occupied by the British. We were not colonized by the British. So they are 
they change that narrative or changing that narrative, which has a very different connotation when you say occupied. Yeah. I just have to say, by the way, are you seeing on the chat, Jill, uh, Gil Achai, Achai, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Thank you for saying that because I think we do have to move. Yes, representation matters, absolutely. And, it, and the journalist in me is always asking, what's the next page, then what happens, right? Um, representation, representation matters, but if we don't dig a little deeper, if we don't examine the existing frameworks and don't interrogate them and then provide a different narrative, right? So instead of replacement, it's replenishment. And you know where people see that the most? Their food. Can you imagine America without immigrant food? <laughs> what would it be? You know, and by the way, in the research for this book, I found out that this country, we sell more salsa than ketchup. There are more taquerias than there are burger joints, right? In many ways, uh, people's first experience with Asian people is with, is through Asian food. When, you're, when you live in Iowa or Wisconsin or in the middle of Arkansas. Right. And so all of these things that we do, food, sports, all of these things are actually tools for being seen as more than labor and for being seen as, quote unquote, other. Right. Like we all eat. We all have to eat. <laughs> you know, like we we all enjoy sports and whatever, whatever sports that may be. Right. So say we say we. Talked about in our in our pre meeting, and you mentioned in your comments about media, and we have to, we are all media consumers. Yeah. Yep. And you said I don't know if it, if it was today or yesterday. You said you know more more people watch YouTube. Yeah. Than CNN, Fox, ABC, NBC, CBS, and so there's so much narrative created, reinforced or exacerbated, and I mean false mm -hmm. narrative. And that's that's the storytelling piece. Yes. Who, who does storytelling best? The, the false narrative people or the correct, or those of us who are trying oh, to- the, By far the false narrative people. They elected a president. The false narrative people elected a president. And I don't know why I have not seen that as a headline, but that's what that that is y'all what happened. So even this lie, I'm working on an essay now for the New York Times, actually, that hopefully this fall will be published, um, is, you know, the whole lie about illegals are voting. With what? You won't even give us driver's licenses. What are we going to vote with? Right? And yet, how many articles, how many news segments have you seen on this? And, you know, Karen, what's really disappointing for me as a journalist, and being a journalist is really at the core of not only my professional life, but my intellectual life. I'm always asking, what don't I know? Who's not in the room, right? Like, what's the context that shapes the facts, right? Like, those are the questions that since I was 16 years old, I had to keep asking myself, right? And so the fact that journalists themselves are spreading misinformation and disinformation, the fact that the fact that the the people whose task it is to inform and educate the public are misinformed and miseducated themselves is a huge problem. So so this summer at Define American, we're going to all of the – there's a um, the National Association for Black Journalists, Association for Asian Journalists, Association for Hispanic Journalists, and we're going to be there actually just making sure that all the journalists – have all of the information that they need. So when they report on this issue in this election year, it's responsible. And mind you, those are just the people of color organizations. There's the Investigative Reporters Institute where everybody goes, right? Because the reality is uh, newsrooms in this country are still not reflective of the demographic of the country, right? Um, which is a really, really, in many ways, I actually think the death of newspapers in America, you can make an argument that the that the moment news organizations, particularly newspapers, miss the demographic shift that's happening is the moment that they've lost their audience. You can make that argument. Yeah. So we've got all of these us, Colorado Health Foundation, everyone that's on this on this call who are wanting to help change narratives, whether it's narratives mm. around 
undocumented, whether it's narratives around LGBTQ, whether it's narratives around um, addiction, whether it's narratives around um, uh, who Black people are, who Latino people are. What are mm -hmm. we to do? Give us some, well, give us some plays <laughs> in our playbook. Um, and again, I think they're going to, by the way, I'm sorry, you all, I was not sharing it on the right. I, 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 I was not sharing the links properly. So now hopefully they've all been shared. And after this Zoom, I will email all of the links I talked about so you can have them. Because in many ways, all of the research we've done, and as you know, Karen, research is expensive, which is why I want as many people to read them, right? You can actually find models and tools for your own narrative change strategies by reading through what we've already done and what we're learning, right? Um, but for me, the most important thing around narrative is really our thinking around audience. I think it's really important. As somebody who, by the way, who worked in corporate media my entire career in journalism and documentary filmmaking, CNN, MTV, Showtime, I did most of my content, most of the content that I produced before I started doing this work we're all for corporate media, right? I am now more convinced more than ever, given the fragmented media environment, that when we say audience, we have to ask ourselves, wait a second, who are we talking to about exactly? So for example, if you were, if you want to make sure, and let me get really specific. So um, DACA is going to be, DACA is over, right? That's the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Um, if you if you if you are an employer in the state of Colorado and you have somebody who had DACA who's about to lose their DACA status, how are you going to keep them employed? What are you going to do? What risky, courageous thing are you going to do to keep your undocumented person who had just lost their work permit employed? What's your narrative around that? Right? Are you willing to be uncomfortable? Immigration law is nothing but awkward and uncomfortable, right? And in my opinion, if you don't feel uncomfortable when you're dealing with immigration policy, then you're probably not doing it right. <laughs> so for me, it's asking yourself, so you, you, you just talk about, for example, Latino representation and Black representation in media, right? Um, unfortunately, local news is really struggling right now, right? Like it's, it's, it's I mean, you look at Denver. I mean, Denver used to be a really rich news haven right i i'm not familiar with like the local uh, news journalism that's out there but to me how can how can your organization karen how can you partner with local news organizations to better frame some of the narratives around communities i actually think philanthropy has a role to play here because newsrooms are struggling they're understaffed you have the data you have the organizations you have the leaders there ought to be some sort of, there could be some sort of, maybe that's actually something we can help you with. There could be some sort of partnership you could be forming with these local news organizations to better inform the community. Because yeah, I hope to the up thing up. We, we do that. We awesome. have a media strategy with local newspapers, um, PBS, CPR, those awesome. organizations. And then how do we make sure that Instagram and TikTok and YouTube are a part of that conversation, right? I mean, I'll never forget, I'm, I, I've done, um, I've interviewed Charlemagne the God, L Lenard a few times. I don't know if you've seen his Breakfast Club. Charlemagne the God's YouTube channel gets way more views on any given day than anything CNN puts out during the day. <laughs> that's why YouTube, I shared that article about how big of a force YouTube is. So much of what's happening around me, a, a video, digital media is happening on YouTube. And investing in that so that we can play offense is really important. Not just defense, offense. Um, you can't do this work without having hope. So what are the hope. bright spots that you see and that... Um, and when you look around the corner, what are we going to be celebrating soon? So what are we, what are we celebrating now? What are we going to be celebrating soon? It's a great question. Um, I'm on a, Gavin, Governor Newsom appointed me to the, um, as a trustee of the California State University System, which is um, the largest four-year college system in the country. Um, I'm, I'm just glad as an undocumented person that I could be appointed to that. 
Um, and so it's been about a year and a half. It's an eight year term. I'll be 50 when the term is over. <laughs> And it's about five, it's a half a million students, right? So it's all the Cal State, Cal State LA, San, San Diego State University, San Francisco State University. And I have to tell you, watching where young people are right now, as it as it relates to what's happening in the Middle East, I have I have found the kind of, you know, clearly this is it in for, for many people, it's it's complex. Because it is, it is complex. I mean, we don't have time to go through the history of the Middle East and what's happened with Israel and all that. But to me, the the encampments and watching the organizing that's happened within students of all races and ethnicities when it comes to making sure that both sides, particularly people in Gaza, are being treated as human beings and seen as people, I I find that very, I find hope in that, right? I find hope in my nieces and nephews who who are much more fluent, um, way more than I was when I was their age, when it comes to dealing with gender and sexual diversity. I find that incredibly hopeful, right? And I hope that up there, Harvey Milk and Baldwin are smiling, knowing that they, that they were a part of that. I find it hopeful that people of color are having more uncomfortable conversations where we realize our differences. Like what, what makes the black experience in this country that not the black immigrant experience, the black experience that comes from an enslaved people that dates back to 1619. How is that a different experience than from someone who just moved here 40 years ago? Right. And how do we bridge the difference in that? And then say that we're now in America and we now have a common goal, which is your equality is tied to my equality, right? I find that hopeful. Um, and so I, I have to make a choice actually to stick to that. Maybe the last thing I'll say is this, you know, I've been in this country 31 years and I can't vote, right? I'm not allowed. I don't have, I, hey, I pay taxes, right? Boston Tea Party, right? Pay taxes, but I'm not allowed to vote. So this fall, I'm really partnering with a lot of voting registration drives on behalf of 11 million undocumented people, right? Uh, on behalf of undocumented people who live in Colorado, please don't take your vote for granted, right? Please exercise your right and your privilege to vote. As someone just made a comment about um, the news media always hype, doesn't, doesn't do good news. Um, yep. And they all, Maria, you're right. Yep. It was Maria making that comment. And unfortunately, you know, it's the good news doesn't sell newspapers or no. doesn't, doesn't mm -hmm. get followers. So, and that's a narrative that, that needs to be, that needs to be. Changed. Yes, absolutely. What news, what media outlets do you think do the best job of being Come on. Uh, that's a hard one. It's hard because I, I, you know, I know a lot of the people that work there and I know that I know that I know my friends at the New York Times. It's. OK, I have kind of a different way of answering that question, which is I think you have to be responsible for your own media diet. OK, you have to be totally responsible and disciplined. I actually think media literacy ought to be a required course for any student graduating from high school, like financial literacy and like civic literacy, right? Like I, I actually think those three things ought to all be combined together. Because for me, there are some things, you know, I'm surprised when I, sometimes I meet people who don't know the difference between a news article and an editorial, right? Like what's an opinion versus, you know, someone that's not, a, this is where the blurring of reality TV, documentary, all of that, that's why, even what I shared at the very beginning, right? What's a narrative? What's a story? A story, Karen has a story, I have a story. But we're all part of a better, what of, of a greater narrative, right? And not enough, two stories are not enough to change a narrative, right? So we need many stories being told in different mediums to change a narrative on something. It's not one approach, right? 
And I think that is key to understanding even how you consume media. Like, to be honest, I used to go on Fox News quite a bit. Uh, so much so that they actually almost offered me like a contract to be on Fox News. And I'm thinking to myself, no, I can't. I cannot do that. But I would get criticized why I would go to Fox News. And my answer was, I don't care about Bill O'Reilly or Megyn Kelly. I care about the person in Nebraska sitting down watching, you know, Bill O'Reilly. And I would do it. And then I would get all these emails from the viewer saying, wait, what do you mean you pay taxes? Can you come to my Chamber of Commerce meeting in Omaha? Yes, I'll be there and I'll bring my tax forms. So that, that was my way of really understanding how incredibly uninformed uh, people are when it comes to this issue. Because the moment I started giving them the facts, I'll never forget this one gentleman said to me, Mr. Vargas, I think you should sue the government. This is taxation without representation. And I said, you know, sir, I'm in enough trouble as it is. Like, I don't think I'm in a position to sue the government, but you are, <laughs> right? Can you go talk to your coworkers, go talk to your neighbors and say the fact that here we are taxing people. By the way, that's the other thing, right? We're probably the only demographic in the country, 11 million people um, who are always a part of the, of the election conversation, but don't get a vote. We don't have a say on this. We, we depend on allies and we depend on people and we may not be the number one thing on their agenda because everybody gets up every day, you know, of course, thinking about, wait, you know, what they're struggling with, right? I can't project onto you, you know, my number one priority. It may not, may, maybe you're number eight, right? And so, and that's where it gets really, it gets really complex. Someone was, um, Maddie talked about using artists, just as we heard Alejandro in the opening, you know, he used that platform and just sharing essentially like a day or two in the life of yes that yes that educated. Yep, yep, yep. Um and 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 for me, by the way, like what you just said, what he shared in that poem had more facts and context than you may have read. In an article or in a segment, right. Maddie made an interesting comment here, is I actually am convinced that it is the role of artists and storytellers to, um, to not only tell the truth, but to remind us also of real clarity that's needed in such a chaotic, incoherent time, right? There's a clarity that comes when you... Sometimes I feel like honesty is some, it's some sort of magic. We rarely hear it spoken out loud. Let me give you a, a, per, a perfect example. So this book that I'm finishing now, it's due in September, all 80,000 words of it. I was in Alabama doing some research on the book and I met um, a, a almost 48, 49 year old um, black man um, who's an, who works in an accounting firm and he's leaning towards voting for Trump. Um, why? immigration, right? He had consumed all of this content on immigration. And then, you know, I get, I met him twice. And the second time I met him, he read up on me. I guess he Googled my name and like all that. And then he goes, hey, Jose, I'm sorry that you're still here illegally. You know, uh, there's no immigration reform. So I'm sorry about that. Um, but just so you know, you know, my family, you know, my gener my ancestors, we've been here for 400 years and we're still not treated as full citizens. Right. So um, you should you should remember that. And as I drove back to the hotel, I thought to myself, "Thank you for." I'm so glad that he named that he named a very a very truthful and honest truth. And at the same time, I wish I had the presence of mind to say, "Just you know, sir, please know that when I'm fighting for my rights to be a full citizen of this country." My hope is to be able to fight for your equal rights to be in this country, right? That our that 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 our goal isn't supposed to be to take somebody else's slice of the pie. The whole goal is actually to make the pie bigger for everybody, right? Um, I hope I had the presence of mind to say that. I ended up emailing it to him anyway. But those are the kind of conversations that I think are more needed, right? Um, that, 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 that get us to see each other in a way where 
I heard him. He sees he sees where I'm at in terms of my struggle. I see where he's coming from. And then we meet somewhere. And to me, that somewhere is this America that we're creating together. Well, Jose, I want to be respectful of your time and the time of everyone, everyone who's uh, tuned in and say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been uh, pr provocative, educational, um, interactive. There's so many, so many uh, comments and uh, people telling pieces of their own story or stories of others. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all for joining us. We're going to continue this discussion about narrative change at our annual symposium this summer. That is the uh, the theme is in parentheses rewriting the narrative, and that's in amazing. That's in late July. So we hope to see everybody that's online there, or at least dial in or tune in. Um, uh, on the on the live stream. So I'll say thank I'm you. gonna put I'm gonna put my email to everybody oh. there. That's my email. And also Karen and to the rest of your staff, I'd love to figure out a way that we can work together as we dig deeper and have more rigor and depth when we talk about narrative change. Oh that's um, wonderful. Yeah. So yeah. all right. Thank you. Thank you so, thank much. You so much. Thanks everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye.